Five, Bustards and Cranes by W.P. Pycraft. The Plover tribe, Bustards, Cranes, and Rails form a large group of diverse but probably closely related forms. Of the Bustards, the most interesting and important species is the Great Bustard. About a hundred years ago, this magnificent bird might have been seen any day in such favorable localities as the Yorkshire and Lincolnshire Wolds, the Norfolk and Suffolk Brecks, the Heaths of Newmarket, or the Downs of Berkshire and Wiltshire. It owes its extermination to several causes, foremost among which must be reckoned the reclaiming of wasteland and improved methods of agriculture. The bulk of its body, says Professor Newton, renders it a conspicuous and stately object, and when on the wing, to which it readily takes, its flight is not inferior in majesty to that of the eagle. The expanse of the outstretched wings of a great bustard is eight feet, or even more, and the weight of the male may even exceed 35 pounds. The female is smaller. To see the great bustard in a wild state today, one would have to travel to Spain, and if one could make a pilgrimage for this purpose during the bird's courting season, some very wonderful antics on the part of the male would be witnessed. These antics make up what is really a very elaborate love display. In this performance, the bird inflates his neck with wind, draws his head closely down onto the back, throws up his tail so as to make the most of the pure white feathers underneath, and sticks up certain of the quill feathers of the wing in a manner that only a great bustard can. Certain long feathers projecting from each side of the head now stand out like the quills of a porcupine, forming a sort of cheval de frise on either side of the head, and complete the picture which in our eyes savors of the ludicrous. The inflation of the neck is brought about by filling a specially developed windbag between the gullet and the skin with air through a small hole under the tongue. For many years it was believed this bag was used as a sort of water bottle to enable the bird to live amid the arid wastes which were its chosen haunts. We now know what its real use is. Visitors to the Natural History Museum in London will find, beautifully mounted, a male bustard in the act of showing off, as it is called, and hard by a dissection of the head and neck, showing this wonderful windbag. Cranes One of the most beautiful of this group of peculiarly handsome birds was once numbered among British birds. Now, alas, like the bustard, it is one of the rarest visitors. Till the end of the 16th century, the common crane reared its young in the Fenlands. In Saxon times, we read of a request being made by King Ethelbert to Boniface, Bishop of Mayence, begging him to send over two falcons, suitable for flying at cranes in Kent. In one case, at a feast given by Archbishop Neville in the reign of Edward IV, as many as 204 cranes figured in the menu. Later, it is interesting to note, they seem to have fallen somewhat into disfavor, since we read of a Dr. Muffet of Wiltshire, somewhere around 1570, declaring cranes to be distinctly unfit for sound men's tables, yet being young, killed with a goshawk, and hanged two or three days by the heels, eaten with hot gelatine, and drowned in sack, it is permitted unto indifferent stomachs. The nest is placed on the ground and contains from two to three eggs. The young are covered with down and, like plovers and bustards, run as soon as hatched. The cranes, like many other birds, notably some of the plover tribe, occasionally indulge in spirited outbursts of dancing. Mr. Nelson, writing of the birds of Alaska, tells how one day he was watching two cranes enjoying themselves in this manner. The male suddenly wheeled his back towards the female and made a low bow, his head nearly touching the ground and ending by a quick leap into the air. Another pirouette brought him facing his charmer, whom he greeted with a still deeper bow, his wings meanwhile hanging loosely by his side. She replied by an answering bow and hop 
and then each tried to outdo the other in a series of spasmodic hops and starts, mixed with a set of comically grave and ceremonious bows. Cranes vary much in general appearance. Some species have much of the skin round the head bare and brilliantly colored, such as the Saurus crane of India and the crowned crane. The white and whooping cranes are birds of wondrous beauty. The first named species has not been inaptly called the lily of birds. The whole plumage, with the exception of the black quills, is white. The legs are red, as is also the face. Dr. Cowes, an American ornithologist of great repute, relates how he once mistook one of these birds, the whooping crane, for an antelope. He and a companion saw what they took to be an antelope standing quietly feeding with his broad white stern toward us and only about 500 yards off. We attempted for at least 15 minutes to flag the creatures up to us, waving a handkerchief on a ramrod. This proving unavailing, my friend proceeded to stalk the game and crawled on his belly for about half the distance before the antelope unfolded his broad black tipped wings and flapped off, revealed at length as a whooping white crane. Another very remarkable species is the crowned crane. This is an African species and takes its name from the tuft of curiously modified feathers on the top of its head. The colored plate gives a good idea of its general appearance. The Suriyama. This is a very hawk-like looking bird. Indeed, by some ornithologists, it has been regarded as closely allied to the hawks and eagles, and more especially to the secretary bird. Really, however, it is a very ancient kind of crane. The trumpeters, the corlins, the kagu, and the sun bittern are other ornithological puzzles. Concerning the precise affinities of these birds, much is yet to be learnt. They are, however, undoubtedly related to the cranes. The last mentioned is a small bird with wonderfully beautiful wings, which it displays with great effect to its mate during the courting season. End of section five.